everybody and welcome back to Keeping Up With Champagne Lady. I hope you enjoyed last week's show. Javan, lovely to see you again. Good to be here again. How's your week been? Look, my week's been crazy, but uh, I managed to go in and get some more shirts from Crane Brothers, which I'm is glad great. to hear that. So I'm not wearing the same <laughs> thing again. We can't <laughs> have that because you know how I hate short sleeve shirts. That's always important and I've been busy working and all those sorts of things. But you know, I'm really excited tonight because we've got some of our friends on the show, don't we? Uh, especially the one that's made my eyebrows look, you know, so on fleek. Tonight we have Dez Harris, chef extraordinaire from the Hunting Lodge. We have Megan McDowell, fantastic artist. And once again we have Rochelle, the raw pharmacist, coming to sort out my sciatica. We have Amanda Garan, who does the most wonderful eyebrows. And don't forget a mutual friend that's very close to both of us, isn't she, Anne? Oh, you mean Michelle Bogue, of course. <laughs> That'll be interesting. But I also had to go and revisit Graham Thompson, his beautiful jewellery store, because I just missed seeing a few items that I thought might be of interest. Oh gosh, I'm feeling sorry for Richard about now. <laughs> he is too. <laughs> <laughs> It's great to have you in the studio. We were had such a lovely time the other day at the Hunting Oh, you're Lodge. welcome, Anne. Thank you. Mm, and the Thanks. food was amazing. But I'm glad. I intended to chat with you then. We just sort of ran out of time. Well, and we you picked were flat up out. some casual tables, and that's what happens, right? Mm. You know. Well, yeah. that's the way you want it, isn't mm, it? Exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to let the viewers know about the changes that have happened up at the Hunting Lodge because I used to go there when I was much younger. And things are so Steeped different. Steeped in history, right? There's a lot of history mm. with that kind of patch of dirt. A lot of people associate uh, with the restaurant, uh, mm. especially. And, you know, over the years, it, it was good and it was average and it was good and it was reopened and closed. And, and uh, we've reopened it now after about eight years. So the Sutton family have, uh, you know, acquired the vineyard. And uh, last November, we just quietly opened the restaurant and uh, just, yeah, working on things. When I heard the hunting lodge was opening again, and even better that you were there, mm. I thought, wow, this is going to make my whole weekend. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got to remember, I'm not doing fine dining anymore. Those days have, have gone, but we're very much about, uh, like our patch of dirt and, and sort of a comfort focus to, you know, our, our package and what we offer. So um, the food is, you know, you can look into a dish and see something with a little bit of edge, or you can just eat it. So that's kind of always been my philosophy. And uh, to do it in this simplistic nature, based on produce, mm. uh, is it was very creative and very inspiring. Well, I really yeah. enjoyed my meal because I had the beautiful salmon dish. And mm. is it red radish that goes over it, or is it beetroot? I wasn't uh, sure. So this, and this is a, like a little story. Um, when you look into the food, so we get some lovely acaroa salmon. We like to use acaroa salmon because it's a little less fatty. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we cure it and cold smoke it. Uh, we first created it to go with our home block Sauvignon Blanc, so it's been aged a little bit in the barrel, so it, so it lends itself to a little bit of smoke. Hence the match with the salmon. We make a little vinegar with some leftover wine from the wine production, so that sits under the salmon to provide the acidity. And then uh, originally we had golden beetroots that we salt baked ah, and we that's shaved, what it is. shaved over like truffles over the dish. So it was kind of very free form. We had marigold flowers mm. and growing in the garden so we could just very casually, you know, so it's very organic. Yes. Stone fruit came through so we started to like put a little bit of shaved stone fruit on there as well because you need, a dish should never just sit still. A dish needs to evolve to eventually you get to the point where, well, we'll just take it off the menu and do something else. Here was yeah. I thinking I was going to whip it up at home. No. <laughs> it sounds a bit complicated for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, for me, like, it's always been about if we can put three components on the plate and it can be visually, uh, be visually appealing. Yes, that's it so eats important. eats very well. You know, dishes have to eat very well if you tick those boxes. Mm. You know, the, the best part about working at the winery for me is the connection to the land. So that's the connection with a permaculturist, which is a, a flash name for a, a, a gardener. Yes. Um, and our winemaker. Um, so Who is the winemaker Well, now? Pete, Pete Turner is, is the winemaker. I must um, meet him. I'll try and sell him some of my wine barrels. <laughs> <laughs> do that, do I that. Do not miss an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, so we're very boutique, very, uh, very kind of, um, yeah, we're original. Like Pete likes to be a little bit creative with, with his wines, so they're not so kind of just conformist. Mm. What are the main uh, um, types of wine that you're making up there? 
Well, it's interesting that our portfolio has uh, has extended this year to a Chardonnay, uh, a couple of Chardonnays yes. actually. Um, we have our home block uh, vines on our property, but we also have vines in the Hawke's Bay, Gisborne and uh, in Marlborough as well. So we've got quite a diverse portfolio, yes. which pieces, you know, has license to expand and, yes. and have a play. Um, I brought a, uh, you know, Chardonnay is, is something that chefs are often into, right? Mm. So a bigger palate, creamier, more yes, depth. Yes. So, you know, Chardonnay's a real So these are oak-aged, obviously, yeah. rather than in the stainless steel. Mm, mm, so he Great. likes to have a good play. But I brought along with me today, if I can find it, here we go. Oh. This is uh, an interesting wine, actually. There's a really good story behind that, and it shows, you know, uh, the... Oh, but look, sorry, I just need to... I'm a bit short-sighted. No, that's all good. So this is a, what we call our crowd brand blend um, rosé. Oh. Um, so 300 civilians, if I, if I may use the term, have contributed uh, to this. Um, they were each given a box of uh, components to mix mm. to come up with what they thought the ideal rosé would be to their palate. Yes. We had a look at all of the entries and, and Pete chose his best one. Mm. Might have tweaked it a little bit, but uh, primarily this is... Uh, with that in mind and it's oh that's fantastic uh, mm. now i see you've got something else there what oh yeah i just brought along like you know we we love our pinots um where does the pinot we? come from so this one comes from marlborough okay um the previous vintage was organic um this is just newly bottled so it's got a little bit of bottle shock the winemaker this morning like chucked a label on for oh, me really? so i could so i could bring it in so we're just in the process of releasing our new wines um, and we are so stoked because we basically run out of all of last year's vintages. That's fantastic. So we're super happy that, uh, you know, that, that we're stepping it up and yes. we're getting some recognition and yes. people actually liking what they drink and I'm really impressed with the progression that Pete's showing. Well, look, thank you so much for coming in, Des, and I'll be seeing you very soon. Go on. <laughs> for <laughs> another you. fantastic meal. Thank you. The last time was in a stretch limo, the time before the, the DB11, and that was a fun day, so we'll have to do that again. How are you going to step up your next wheels? <laughs> oh, I have to helicopter in. Oh, well, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have done that in the past as well, so maybe we'll have to have another rerun. Okay, sounds mm. pretty flash. Look right. forward to it. Well, cheers. Thank, thank you, you so much. No, you're welcome. Megan, I'm just thrilled to have you in the studio. I mean, I've had such a lovely time looking at your works of art today, but I wanted to give the audience the opportunity to know just how this came about. How did you get into this field? Oh, so it started about July last year. Um, I've been studying floristry um, uh, for, I think, the last eight months, and uh, I was watching Game of Thrones, actually, and the quote, what is dead may never die came about and it resonated so much with what I was doing because I was taking home flowers uh, to my studio and, and shooting them as they died, really. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's a worry. <laughs> wow, actually, you know, the flowers aren't necessarily dead at the end of their vase life. Oh. Yeah, they actually become... That sounds like a slow death. Oh, oh. oh no. <laughs> but they do it so gracefully. It's, yes. it's beautiful, the transformation they take and, and the texture that they uh, in, encompass. It, it's beautiful for a photographer to capture that. Mm. And so that's what um, I did. And the Rebirth of Flowers was born. And uh, a whole collection of fine art was made. Mm. Well, I do like the idea that basically they never died. Mm. And it's a bit like a person never dying because they're kept in your heart, mm -hmm, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So with these flowers, it gives them the opportunity to live on in your works of art. Mm -hmm. You know, you can buy flowers and, and put it in your home, but they do die. Yes. And Too quickly, unfortunately, too quickly, sometimes, yes, sometimes. Particularly in the summertime. I mean, oh, night yes. roses often get the droops within a couple of days. It's really <laughs> annoying, isn't it? Well, I hope you change the water. <laughs> <laughs> mm, maybe that was a problem. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, but it, it's exactly, I, I want to keep it in the home longer, and that's what this was all about, mm. was, was limited edition prints that people could hang. I mm. was particularly taken with some of them because I'm, of course, looking for something to put in our bedroom. Mm -hmm. And whilst I really like the ones that, that sort of cover, they encompass the whole frame, you mm -hmm. know, from right to the frame. Mm -hmm. For my own personal taste, I liked the ones that were more simple. Mm -hmm. And there were a few that I really liked. I mean, one of them 
if you remember the one with the three mauve roses, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were gorgeous. I loved the colour, and, and they would actually fit really well into Albert. But, but I'm just thinking, they had the droops. Probably not the most appropriate thing to have Probably in Probably not. <laughs> you need some inspiration, don't you? <laughs> yes, yeah, so maybe the red rose would have been better. The red rose, yes, I think so too, yeah. Yes, yeah. So they were just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming in and having a chat about no, it. thank and you. I'm going to be back. I've just got mm -hmm. to make a decision as to which piece is going to go best. I think I'll bring Richard in to have a look as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Need the man's point of view. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly after my comment. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Excellent. Now, oh, well, that's lovely. Well, thank you so much, Megan. I got the name right now, yes. Megan, with an A rather than an E. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, cheers. Cheers, and thank you for having me. Yes, a pleasure. We'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs> Amanda, thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure. I have to say, Javan came back the other day. I had told him about you and the eyebrows and generally what you're doing. Thank you. And as you remember, he did run into you at lunch that day. Yes. NSP. Well, he said, I need my eyebrows done. I've got to get hold of Amanda. <laughs> so, of course, I sent him off to you and he came back looking stunning. Oh. Very relaxed, I might add. I hear he fell asleep. Don't tell him that. <laughs> Well, not to worry about that, but yes. it was amazing. He looked so good. And you look amazing. Your eyebrows, oh, they're putting mine to shame. Thank you. Oh, so, no. <laughs> but that we have to let the rest of the people know just what you're doing because thank you're you. fairly new to New Zealand, aren't you? I am. I'm very fresh to New Zealand, hence the accent is still very thick. Um, but it was a pleasure doing Javon's eyebrows. Oh. So um, giving a bit of background on what I did to Javon, we did a bit of a shape and a tint. We essentially, with a male brow, groom the area without overshaping, do a bit of a tint to pick up the little hairs that aren't so obvious and give a bit more of a masculine brow. That really applies to women also, so I'm not sure if you've had your brows tinted. Never, never. It's fabulous. So it just picks up the hairs by colouring them. It's very temporary, so it works probably on the hair for about a week and it can create some real definition for the face. But a step up for that is the actual henna. So henna is a new thing that we've been playing around with with hair. It's been around forever um, and it had a bit of a bad reputation, but we've been able to fine tune it. So it's a beautiful treatment for eyebrows. So I have drawn mine in today. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> yours aren't hennaed in. I'm a fraud. Yes, mm. I henna my eyebrows. So it's a technique where we actually stain the skin. So rather than having the tint effect, which only lasts for a few days, it actually lasts for the life cycle of the hair, but it also oh, stains the skin. It can be if mm. you're a little bit scared. <laughs> yes. But it does stain the skin as well, so it gives you the effect that I have today with that penciled in kind of powder look. A step up from that is the tattooing that I do, and I love, it's probably my biggest passion, where you revamp the face by recreating an eyebrow. So I love to work with women who have lost theirs through illness, but just as much the vain girls like me who yes. like to have their brows reconstructed. What happens if you were getting it tattooed and then the fashions change? Absolutely. And so I've had many women come in with photos of the light of so Brooke Shields and saying, I want that. Mm. I won't. I'll be more inclined to turn someone away than do that to them because mm. it's negligent in yes. my opinion. So what I do is I measure the face and the bone structure and I will design a brow based on the genetics of the face. So yes. a balance of the eyes, the face height, just a lot of um, measurement work based on your brow and where your eye socket is. Mm. And then I will negotiate that shape with the client. So yes. I will never go to a fashion trend. I'll go with what I believe so nature extreme. should have given you in the first place. And a lot of women will have the microblading added to give a bit of definition, yes. whereas some will have it as a complete reconstruction. It can be such a wonderful technique for so many different women mm. and men, mm. um, but it is more common with females to have it done. Well, it's a bit like having, I mean, if you've really got no time for anything but a couple of things. Yes. Eyebrows, <laughs> eyelashes and some lippy and just Off whoop, you go. a little bit of blush and you're away, aren't Normally you? that's me. Um, I hate wearing makeup. Mm. I love it for an event but during the day when yes. I'm working I don't have time to have my face fully done up. So, yes. But I also want to look good. That's right. So a lot of women are time poor. It's fabulous for that. Just away you go. Lip gloss, eyelashes and out the door. Yes. 
Well, I remember when I was first doing Housewives and the makeup artist at the time came in and she wanted to give me, it wasn't my Ambika who I have now, but it was somebody else. She wanted to give me these quite heavy brows and I looked at myself and I thought, I don't like this <laughs> at all because it was actually heavier than I wear now yeah. and this is heavier than I used to wear. <sighs> but I, I really like it now. Yeah. But Previously, you know, with this first makeup artist, it was quite sort of growly, sort of raw, oh. aggressive, and it reminded me of years ago, Saturday Night Fever. And you might even remember this thing, but there was this woman in there, I forget her name, but she was the one who got pregnant and everyone wanted to sort of shun her at school. Oh. And she had these big, heavy eyebrows. And I thought, oh my God, I look like whatever her name was. No. And I didn't want that because I didn't fear it looked very elegant. Whereas no. I always want to look elegant, classy. I don't Absolutely. want to look sort of in your face. Unkept and bushy. Yes, yeah. yes. Absolutely. So there's definitely a happy medium with of it, Of course, isn't it? and that's why it should be a negotiation. I think, and I've had the experience in the past when I was wasn't the brow lady mm. where I would get my brows done and I wasn't spoken to it was just what I got was what yes, I got yes. and I didn't like that so part of why I do what I do the way that I do is because I have been that person yes. and I understand what an impact the eyebrow can have to the face yes the whole experience should be a real pleasant one it shouldn't mm. just be about I know what I'm doing yes. you get what I give you yes so it should be a real process where you create something that makes you feel good but you can also feel really relaxed and calm in the mm, process and know the person's going to do the right thing yeah absolutely mm. I, I believe that it should be more than just getting the service done it should be a whole experience and yes. I hope that everyone that sees me feels really comfortable at ease and listen to so that they feel that they have a friend in me and someone they can trust so they come back again yes um, and I have had a success rate that's been really high so far so it must be working well that's lovely i'm sure lots of people are going to be rushing in thank you so, so much so they all have brows as favorite as yours oh fabulous <laughs> thank you so much anna really thank appreciate you. time cheers, cheers. <laughs> rochelle hello Anne. what have you got for me this time well i thought today <laughs> if we Go over your latest um, health issue, yes. if you don't mind. What do you mean latest? That makes it sound like I've got a lot of them. <laughs> it seems to be one a week. Yes. Um, so you've got sciatica. Yes, it's yeah. been giving me hell. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty bad. And it is um, a problem that is really hard to fix. So the sciatic nerve runs um, from both sides of the lower back and it goes down the leg. So you've got, especially in the evening you were saying, um, mm. a lot of leg pain, is that right? Yes, the worst time actually is when I'm not doing anything. So during the day, as you know, I'm running around, busy as a little bee, and going out at night and so on. But the moment I get home and you get into bed, that's when it just starts. It's this throbbing, throbbing, throbbing. And it's actually more between the knee and the foot just down the side, the outside of the leg, and it's just a nightmare. And I've, I've, I have to tell you, I've been having to resort to Tramadol, which you know I'm not into drugs. I see you raise your arm, but I'm not into drugs. You know what I'm like. I'm really yeah. into natural things. But it's just made me so miserable. And after weeks of not getting any sleep, I thought, I can't go on like this. I've just got to do something. Okay, so with the Tramadol, um, it, it doesn't go so well with the alcohol and you know that I've mentioned that to you before. Mm. So really important that we work at getting um, you off tramadol or minimizing the dose, as long as you can be comfortable because it is important that you're not in pain. Of course. Right, so you're only using this in the evening, that's yes. fantastic, because a lot of people have to use it all through the day as well. So you yes. are managing, and yes. I think that's because of some of the supplements that you take, mm. and also you eat really, really well. Yes. Okay. Well, I do, as you know, I'm, I take the magnesium and the turmeric you got me onto. Yeah, so uh, with the magnesium, of course, it relaxes the central nervous system, so it helps with the nerves, okay? And then the turmeric is very much anti-inflammatory, all right? So we've got you on a good dose of that, and that's probably helping to manage the pain, right? Um, and then we've just formulated, and we did this in the US, it's a cream that we're not marketing yet, but I've got this for you yes. uh, to try. Oh, this is the one you've had made specially for me, isn't yeah, it? it is. So you're, you're trialing that. <laughs> did you mention um, that? Yes. We can't, we're not going to market that till mm. we get a, a result, like a positive result mm. from you. So, so I'm so going to be the guinea pig? You are the guinea pig. Right. I don't mind that. That's okay. So I thought, as well as what you're doing, to use the cream. Okay. okay and it's got a lot of menthol in it. Okay. And then also I thought a good thing is, because you said you had avocado for breakfast yes. today, but you've got to really up your um, omega oils because they're anti-inflammatory, mm. all right? So I want you having lots of salmon. 
Yes, and I do have a lot of salmon. Yeah, yeah. So important to have that. And then you can supplement, of course, with the clean fish oil. Okay. Okay. Not, not the... Um, there's a lot that come out of China, not, not that one. We, oh, wouldn't have those, some, absolutely yeah. not. No. Something from Iceland, something really clean. Yes. All right? So how many times am I supposed to put this cream on? What does it say? It doesn't say how many times. That's because you're the guinea pig. So okay. So you've got to trial it. So All right. At least at night time and then um, in the morning. All right. And see how you go. Do it again at lunchtime. But we've got to get you off the tramadol. That's the main goal. I know, I know. You're right because I don't want to be stuck on those things. Yeah. So there you go. All and right. Then, um, oh, well, that's lovely. Well, we have to have a little click of the champagne. Okay, You've we'll been selling a... me all the stuff, so I've got to sell you some stuff, something because I've got to get you onto the champagne one way or another. Let's see. <laughs> Cheers. Doing back in Parnell. Yeah, this is a pretty special bracelet. Certainly It'll be even is. more special oh on your wrist. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on here. Good. Well, the, the, the trouble is it makes my other one pale and insignificant, isn't it? No, a confidence your other one. <laughs> it's from the Deco period, mm -hmm. about 1910, 1915. Oh, um, it's in platinum, but it's probably the best bracelet. Probably in New Zealand, to oh, be honest. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful so bracelet. Stunning, isn't but it? there's another one we probably more every day that you could wear this Cartier oh, Love, of course. Oh, this Cartier Love bracelet. Oh, yeah, that's gorgeous. Yeah, and I this love is that. Well, once it's on, you don't need to take it off. It's got a little attachment that you. You better put that on the same. Gosh, gosh, I'll be laden <laughs> down with them. See, you need. You don't need. You I need, need all three. Is that what you That's right, and you need uneven numbers. You see, yes, you can't have yes. two. You've got to have three. Gosh. Things always look better. But that's beautiful, isn't it? That's rose gold. Yeah, is it? That's, that's right. stunning. You could wear that with anything. Yeah, it could go you? with your other pieces of jewellery. Mm -hmm. I think that's. Of course, I've been wearing this one so many times. As yes, you you've got I'm good use out of that one. Hey, that's, that's, nice. This would go well with what you're wearing today. It would, wouldn't it? Now that's special. Oh, that's beautiful. That's too, handmade, isn't it? especially for me. Oh, I thought you were going to say for me. <laughs> no, <laughs> for me, for you. Right, I'm not silly you. It's a chain reaction. <laughs> No, I that's like that. gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, that's lovely. Okay. All right, Grandma. Well, thank you so much. Well, I'll um, keep, it, keep in mind. Yeah. And, and I can put I can pop around to your place if you want me to bring them around right. one day or one evening. And if you ask that one, we'll What we do is fill Richard up the champagne. Michelle, it's fantastic to have you on the show. We've known each other such a long time. Indeed. So, tell everybody, when did you get involved in the National Party and tell me why? Well, it was quite a few decades ago, actually, Anne. In fact, my first campaign was the 1975 general election. And Jeez, I, I have to say, boring. you're right, I was, I was still a teenager, uh, but actually I joined the Young Nationals in order to impress the mother of a boyfriend uh, who actually you know and uh, who still does your hair. Yes, I know exactly <laughs> who you mean. Gary, hi! <laughs> Yes, yes, lovely June. She was fantastic, wasn't she? She, she tried was. to recruit me as well. <laughs> yes, I think you were a bit busy doing other things. Yeah, probably. Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, we've come a long way since then, haven't we? Have we ever? Mm. Uh, yes, and it's been it's been fascinating. I mean, I had no background in politics at all. In fact, my parents always said the only secret they ever kept from each other was how they voted. Oh, for goodness <laughs> sake. And having come from West Auckland, you know, the, the Remuera National Party was a long way from where uh, I was used to socialising. Yes. Uh, but it's been really interesting because of the doors it's opened for me professionally. So yeah. tell me, what do you think about Simon Bridges? How do you think he's going to go? Well, I've been quite impressed, actually. I think he's made some really good choices for spokesmen. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see how they go in the House this week, uh, you know, with some match-ups between, for example, uh, Phil Twyford and Judith Collins. I think mm -hmm. that's going to be a good match-up. And she got a good position, didn't she? She did indeed. She's been promoted significantly, and uh, we all know Judith relishes <laughs> that sort of uh, attention. Yes. So I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how Amy Adams goes against Grant Robertson. Amy's a very clever woman. 
but she hasn't got as much experience in that finance area. Mm. Grant's been working in it for quite some time before he became minister. So it's going to be a lot of fun, I think, in the House. And do you think Phil Twyford has to watch out? Well, I think Phil Twyford's problem is that he was going to start building houses the day after the election. He hasn't built <laughs> one yet, and we're sort of coming up six months. So, yeah, I think uh, there'll be quite a few weaknesses for Judith to exploit. Mm. And she will not miss a beat, I can imagine. But the yeah. funny thing is with Judith, I mean, the other night it was hilarious because I have actually never met Judith in the flesh. <laughs> and we were at that function. In fact, all of us were there together. And you were introducing me, and I didn't even realise who she was. And then I suddenly clicked as I was about to say, what was your name again? And then I said, oh, Judith. And I said, the reason I didn't recognise you is because you're so much younger and prettier looking in real life she's than you are on TV. She's got beautiful skin. She has, mm, she's gorgeous. Mm, so mm. as long as she does the job well, that's all we're interested in. Just thinking about the Labour Party now, how young do you think is too young to be involved in politics? Well, that's a really good question because I've been very interested in the responses about how young the people were at this particular Labour Party camp where obviously alcohol was present and was being served and I suspect that none of those parents had given permission. Mm. Uh, I've also had a look to see if there's an eligible age to join Young Labour and apparently there isn't one, it's certainly not spelt out. Oh really? And it was interesting that uh, Jacinda Ardern said that the people who were at the camp were 16 plus but Andrew Curtin actually said they were either 15 or 16. And I've even heard suggestions that there may have been 14 year olds there. So really, if you're going to be in that situation, then I think you need to have people who are entitled uh, to be served alcohol. Mm. You know, I think it's very dangerous precedent to have children these are children. Mm, of course they are. And especially anyone under Easily 16. Easily influenced. Yeah, and, and, you know, without fully developed senses of, mm. of what they should be doing. So I think in the future they should be absolutely clear, if you're not 18, you shouldn't be there. Mm. And does the same thing happen in the National Party, Michelle? Well, we do have young national members who I know have joined at the age of 16 or 17 but I've never been or seen any circumstances where they've been uh, exposed to alcohol, except, for example, at a party conference where there might be a dinner and there'd be young nets present, and but they're in a situation where it's mm. all very well mm. supervised controlled. and controlled by adults. Yeah. And I must say one thing is that, um, you know, I joined the Labour Party when I was 14 years old, uh, which you know about, we've spoken about, and so, Obviously, what's recently happened, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's an isolated incident, so it's good that they're looking at, you know, sorting those things out. But the one thing I, I wondered is, you know, how, how do you think the victims feel at the moment and the parents, and what do you think is going to happen with them going forward? And do you think, um, you know, when you look at a bigger picture, because when you look sort of 10 years ahead with these young people, this must be quite, you know, how are they feeling right now? Because I know how I felt when I was younger, when I was in the Labour Party. How do you think they feel and what implications this might have on their future? Well, I think if I was a parent, I'd be very angry. Mm -hmm. Very, very angry. Number one, that I wasn't informed about what was actually going to take place at this camp. And number two, the fact that I wasn't told about it mm. afterwards. That's the worst thing. Yes. I always say with anything in life, look, excuse the French, but shit happens. Things go wrong. and. You just have to be upfront about it. You have to take ownership of what's happened, of the mistakes you've made, and then talk about it, sort it out, and move on from it. But trying to hide things, push th something under the rug, is just not acceptable. That's right. So J Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, you know, she's riding on a wave at the moment, or she has mm. been recently. What do you think this does to her image and, and the image of the party as a whole? Obviously, she can't be held responsible solely for this, or, or at all potentially, but what do you think this will do to her? Well, as always, uh, from what I've seen, she's handled the responses very well. She's very good at talking through things. I've always said I think that the Teflon uh, exterior that she has, I think will protect her pretty much, but it will be others in the party who let her down. Uh, and I think and we're we certainly, we are starting mm. to see that, yeah. So, um, 
here's to the future. <laughs> We've got a lot of past to share. Sorry you haven't got the champagne. No, because I don't drink it. I know, I, I know. Water. I won't take offence. I may right. be the only non-champagne drinker on your show. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'll forgive you. Thank you. Cheers.